My name is Alex Rack. I'm a second year master's student here at the University of Minnesota studying choral conducting. And I'd like to begin with a quote. Music will enable you to see past facts to the very essence of things in a way which science cannot do. The arts are the means by which we can look through the magic casements and see what lies behind. Ray Fawn Williams was one of the great composers of the first half of the 20th century and a main figure in the second English Renaissance. His music captured a nation's consciousness through two world wars and remains popular today throughout the world, performed by amateurs and professionals alike. He lived a long and productive life, composing well into his 80s. He was born in Down Empney on October 12, 1872, to a wealthy family. His mother was the niece of Charles Darwin, and he had a private income throughout his life. He went to prep school near Brighton in 1883, where he first began playing viola and was introduced to the music of J.S. Bach. In 1887, he went to Charterhouse School in Surrey, and in 1890, he went to the Royal College of Music, an institution just seven years old at the time. He was initially going to study organ at the urgings of his parents, but after two years of instruction, he began to study composition with Sir Hubert Perry, who became Vaughan Williams's longest and most influential teacher. Perry, who was the driving force of the Second English Renaissance, introduced him to Beethoven, the importance of the British choral music tradition, and the works of Wagner, which had an important influence on his early compositions. In 1892, Rafe went to Cambridge to study history and music, and continuing his compositional studies with Perry. He returned to the Royal College of Music in 1885, where he began studying composition with Sir Charles Villiers Sanford. They didn't quite get along at the time because of Rafe von Williams' focus on Tudor modal music from the 16th century. At the time that he returned to the Royal College of Music, he met his good friend Gustav Holst, who ended up being a lifelong compatriot and composer with whom he would trade ideas and critique his and each other's works. That same year he returned to the, the Royal College of Music, he met his soon-to-be wife, Adeline Fisher. Adeline was a talented cellist and the first cousin of the famous author Virginia Woolf. They were married in 1897, and their marriage would last over 50 years. After getting his doctorate from the Royal College of Music, he began composing his early works and lecturing on the idea of national music. Von Williams believed that there was a common grammar of musical style that was forged through common lived experience. He lectured and wrote on this concept up until his death. On one special day in 1903, Rafe heard a laborer sing a folk song called Bushes and Briars which ended up having a profound impact on him as a composer. He believed that these folk songs had a certain mysticism to them that contributed his idea of this common grammar of national music. And throughout his life, he listened to and transcribed hundreds of these folk songs. They were written into his music, and he eventually became the vice president of the English Folk Song Society in 1920. In 1906, he also began writing the English hymnal well, while he was an atheist and later an agnostic, he was always parallel to religious life in England, and he saw a wonderful mysticism in the, the performance of the Anglican tr tradition. In 1907, Rafe went to study with the famous composer Maurice Ravel. He saw that there was a certain hole in his compositional technique. He saw his orchestration was, as he called it, lumpy and he wanted to study with a master of orchestration. He, after learning from Ravel, he learned how to orchestrate in points of color rather than in lines. In the years leading up to the First World War, he wrote his first two symphonies called Sea Symphony and the London Symphony, Fantasia on a theme by Thomas Tallis, and many popular song settings. As the war broke out in 1914, Ray Fon Williams was 42 years old older than most who would fight in war, but he insisted on enlisting to support his country. He became a private in the Royal Army Medical Corps Territorial Force on New Year's Eve, 1914. After initial training in England, he joined the 2-4th London Field Ambulance, part of the 179th Brigade, 
within the 60th Division. During all of his time that he was enlisted, while he was abroad and in England, he found time to form musical ensembles. He was deployed to France in 1916, where he was exposed to the terrors of war. And in his subsequent years, he always downplayed the effect that it had on him, but many of his close family members and friends said that he was, that he was a different person after the war. He was transferred, transferred to Salonika, where he worked a tedious job uh, disturbing pools of water so mosquitoes wouldn't breed, and eventually went back to England for officer training and returned to France in 1917, where he was in charge of 200 horses. After the fighting ended in 1918, he was appointed the director of music for the First Army to provide recreation for the troops stationed abroad. After the war, he was asked to teach composition at the Royal College of Music and became a part of the new compositional orthodoxy and an important influence on the next generation of English composers. He continues compo composing and now is finally published by an English publishing house, Oxford University Press. Prior to now, he had been published by a publisher in Germany. And he began writing many of his most popular works, including his first opera, Hugh the Drover, his Mass in G, his Oratorio Sancta Civitas, Flores Campi for viola and wordless choir, and his ballet, Job, A Mask for Dancing. Sancta Civitas, Job, and eventually his fourth symphony showed a development in his compositional style. No longer were his works so melodic, associated with folk songs, and so pastoral, they showed a new emotional dissonance and modernism. By the 1930s, von Williams had become a cultural figure, and in 1935, he was awarded the Order of Merit by the office of King George V, an honor, an honor only held by 24 people at any time. Von Williams had always been wary of the Nazi party in Germany and saw the rise as an imminent threat to the world order. In 1935, Von Williams wrote his cantata, Dona Nobis Pace, a work which was inspired by growing international tensions and was another stylistic extension of that new modernist style shown in the Fourth Symphony. In 1937, Von Williams was to receive an award from a university in Hamburg. After much deliberation, he was worried about receiving an award from the Nazi regime. He decided to accept the award, and less than two years later, his music was banned by the Nazis. He never find out, found out why his music was banned. As the Second World War began, von Williams once again tried everything he could to help with the war effort. Since he was now 67 years old, he could no longer enlist, but he helped in a number of different ways. He housed refugees, he helped them find work, he helped with the war savings campaign, and gave up some of his land for allotments. In addition, he used his musical talents to support his country by mounting performances of Handel's Judas Maccabeus and Mendelssohn's Elijah, both works banned by the Nazi regime. He also began writing film scores for propaganda movies, like The 49th Parallel, which was a loosely veiled attempt to sway public opinion in the United States to join the war. During the war, he premiered his Fifth Symphony, which was a return to an earlier melodic style for Von Williams, as if he was making an escapist work for the country at war. After the war, he wrote the mirror to that fifth symphony, which was his sixth, which was a cultural landmark for the country. The work was premiered on BBC radio, and it was heard by millions of people, and critics described it as violently emotional. It was as if it was uh, a reflection of how the country was feeling in the wake of the most destructive war. He went on to write three more symphonies and an oratorio and many smaller works, but at, by this point in his career, he was beginning to be eclipsed by his students, and his work never received the same critical acclaim as his sixth symphony. In 1951, his wife died, his first wife died, after 50 years of marriage, and he remarried to a longtime family friend, Ursula Wood. Now that his, his sickly wife was no longer uh, in his life, he had a new freedom to travel the world. He did a, a long lecture tour in the North America and United States. And into his 80s, he was still conducting his works and the passions of J.S. Bach with his Bach choir in Dorking. Von Williams died 
1958 at age 86. And with most composers, there's a period of time after they die that there's a lull in, in performances of their works. But for Vaughan Williams, that period was very brief. Just seven years after his death, many composers around the world began recording and putting on performances of his great symphonies. Vaughan Williams helped usher in a new era of composition in Great Britain and serve as an artistic guide through two world wars. His music is common in churches across the world, despite him being agnostic. And his symphonies, oratorios, and cantatas, like Dono Nobis Pacem, are heard in concert halls throughout the world. I'd like to end with a quote by Vaughan Williams, one of his last public utterances. Bach was behind the times, Beethoven was ahead of them, and yet both were the greatest of composers. Modernism and conservatism are relevant. What matters is to be true to oneself. Good afternoon, my name is Matt Abernathy, and I'm a first year doctoral student in choral conducting. Now, I have to admit that it doesn't take a lot for me to want to talk about Vaughan Williams, and this piece in particular is one of my favorites. I first encountered it when I was 20, and I had just met my soon-to-be conducting mentor, Jerry Blackstone. He introduced me to the piece and said, you should come sing it with me next summer at this festival. So I did. And I thought the first movement was pretty good, and the second movement was pretty interesting. And I got into the third movement, the reconciliation, and I couldn't believe that music like that existed. I couldn't believe that the words and the sounds and the meaning and the colors could all be connected in one movement. And from there, I have been absolutely obsessed with Vaughan Williams ever since. So why did Vaughan Williams write this piece. He was previously known for his enormous contribution to Anglican church music, British folk songs, and symphonic orchestral repertoire. So why would he take a stance and write this anti-war work? Well, Von Williams' views on wars and conflict had a direct impact on his work as a composer. He wasn't a pacifist like his younger contemporaries Benjamin Britten or Michael Tippett, but he was strongly against war, having experienced it firsthand in World War I. So when the Huddersfield Choral Society commissioned him to write a work for their centenary in 1936, Vaughan Williams wrote an oratorio as a plea for peace at a time when the world was steadily heading towards another major conflict. By the time Vaughan Williams was writing this work, he'd settled into his own compositional style, which combined the tunefulness of folk music, the polyphonic writing of the Tudor era, Anglican hymnody, and elements of French Impressionism. During this sort of middle-late compositional period between 1931 and 1943, as war broke out and was fought across Europe, Von Williams was composing three major works. Symphony No. 4, which premiered in 1934, the Dona Nobis Pacem, which premiered in 1936, and Symphony No. 5, which premiered in 1943. Given this time period and Von Williams' busy schedule as a civilian volunteer during, on the home front, some critics argue that his Symphony No. 4 was a premonition of war to come, and indeed its violent first movement does suggest a kind of conflict. Furthermore, this descending half-step motive in the Fourth Symphony, as well as the descending half-step motive heard at the beginning of the Dona Nobis Pacem, sung by the solo soprano, serve as kind of a thematic connection, but it is a loose connection at best. Just to frame this compositional sound, let's hear a little bit of the Fourth Symphony. music is his fifth symphony, which other critics have argued is a cry for peace. Now, 
Vaughn Williams argued against these illusions every time that they came up, and he firmly believed that his symphonies were absolute music. They had no other secondary meaning beyond exactly what you heard in the concert hall. But given the time period, given Vaughn Williams' active uh, work in World War I, World War II, and the fact that he was simultaneously writing the Dona Nobis Pachem, it's easy to see where there might have been some thematic combination and influence between these three works. Now, as we've already noted, Vaughn Williams believed in an active approach to addressing conflict, which was clear by both his voluntary service in World War I, despite being 42 at the time, as well as his busy civilian life during World War II. He, he was aware of the attitudes of his fellow countrymen as war loomed. He says in his 1940 essay, The Composer in Wartime, whatever this war is, it is not boring. It may have been unnecessary, it may be wrong, but it cannot be ignored. It will affect our lives and those of generations to come. Is it then not worthwhile, even for the most aloof artist, to take some stock of the situation, to ensure at least that if and when the war ends, he'll be able to continue composing? His feelings towards conflict reach their musical apotheosis in the Dona Nobis Pachem, where Vaughn Williams uses music and text to illustrate the horrors of war. He begs us to find peace and ultimately shows us that there can be a better future. The work itself calls for a sizable orchestra as well as a large chorus in the vein of the English choral festival tradition, as well as a soprano and baritone soloist. Now the text of the cantata is of the utmost importance. Von Williams always read the text of the work to the chorus before he get, began rehearsing to ensure that they fully understood the meaning of the words outside the composer's setting of them. In the Dona Nobis Pacem, Von Williams creates his own libretto, or what we call an anthology cantata, which uses several disparate texts and combines them into one holistic narrative. So he uses biblical passages from Jeremiah, Haggai, Luke, and Daniel, which sometimes he presents as direct quotations, and sometimes he paraphrases together in their own version, influenced by the scriptural meaning. He also uses part of the Agnus Dei from the Catholic Mass with a particular emphasis on the word dona, meaning to give. Then he shifts to the secular with part of a speech by British statesman John Bright, as well as selections of poetry by Walt Whitman. Now, this, is a, uh, this assembly of text is not unique. It follows the lineage of the Bach Cantata, which also combined poetry and scripture, and it predates its more famous cousin, the Britain War Requiem, which combined the Latin mass and the World War I poetry of Wilfred Owen. We don't know if Benjamin Britten actually drew ideas from the Dona Nobis Pachem in composing his War Requiem, but the similarities and the subject matter in particular are striking. Of all the poets he could have chosen for this work, Vaughan Williams' first choice for text was to look back to Walt Whitman a poet he'd been introduced to by Bertrand Russell when they were students at Cambridge, and had subsequently sat many times in other works like the Sea Symphony, Toward the Unknown Region, and several of his solo songs. What Whitman is worth a brief detour. He was an American poet who lived from 1819 to 1892, and spent most of his life working in the newspaper business, both as a manual laborer and eventually as a newspaper writer. He published his masterwork, Leaves of Grass, in 1855, from which Vaughan Williams draws many texts. In 1862, Whitman uh, heard a rumor about his brother's death in the Civil War and headed south to see if it was true. His brother survived that episode, but Whitman was suddenly confronted with the suffering of the military hospitals and battlefields. These images would haunt his poetry and influence his collection called Drum Taps. Walt Whitman's poetry is an odd choice for Vaughan Williams. We know that Vaughan Williams was a staunch advocate for all things British, so the fact that Whitman was decidedly American and his poems were referencing a war that England wasn't directly involved in makes him an outlier compared to Vaughan Williams' many settings of poets like Shakespeare and Shelley. And yet, it's easy to see why Vaughan Williams would be interested in these words. Their free lyricism, direct representation of war and carnage, which were not typical poetic subjects pre-World War I, and the layers of poetic symbolism must have been ideal as Vaughan Williams worked to stir hearts in this cantata. The other surprising inclusion in this anthology text is an excerpt from a speech by John Bright, a British statesman who lived from 1811 to 1889. 
Bright is remind, remembered as a famous orator, and his speech, The Angel of Death, has been abroad throughout the land, which he delivered to Parliament on February 23, 1855, was in response to his sole opposition to the Crimean War. Von Williams may have seen something of himself in Bright. He was critical of the impending conflict, argued firmly against it, and all of this to no avail. The biblical allusions in Bright's speech, as well as the direct connection to the British government and people, would have also lent some immediacy to the collection of other texts in this cantata. I have to admit, as I gush when I talk about this piece, because I find the unique thing about Vaughan Williams is that the words he picks and the music he creates are inextricably linked. I cannot hear any of this poetry any other way. No matter who sets it, how brilliantly, the Vaughan Williams are in my mind. It's that combination of folk influence where, where melody and words are combined and his lush orchestral color that he creates and the scenes that every movement are. We see the son and the father together. We hear wind blowing through deserted towns and then we hear the utterances of utterly lost and this soiled world evaporating through the texture. It is a brilliantly conceived piece with a deep political meaning. And while Vaughan Williams doesn't outwardly appear to be a composer with a political agenda, it's clear that his stance on violence and hatred compelled him to use this music to convey a message. And while World War II still swept through and destroyed millions of lives, Vaughan Williams reminds us that music is the one thing which defies bombs and blitzes. Music is the one thing which binds together those who live at opposite ends of the globe. Music is the one thing which makes friends of those who have never met and perhaps will never meet, except through the power of the greatest of the arts. 